G'day folks and welcome to another episode of Creative Conversations and my guest today is the wonderful Heather Price who's joining us from Newcastle in New South Wales mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Heather is a writer and performer and I'm going to get her to explain a little bit about what she writes and what she performs during the course of uh, this conversation but uh, Heather, wonderful to see you. Oh, thanks Dave, good to be here. Fantastic. I should tell folks, I've known Heather for, uh, I don't know, a number of years. Um, and I first met Heather when she was my vocal coach. <laughs> so uh, how about that? Um, don't, yeah. don't blame her. She did her best. <laughs> <laughs> I had plenty to work with. Oh, thank you. That's very nice. <laughs> there was plenty of work to be done is another way of looking at it. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So, um, all right, a writer and performer. Now, I obviously know a little bit about um, some of the, the performing and writing that you've done, and I've been lucky enough to to share the stage with you on a couple of occasions uh, over the years. Um, so, tell us a little bit about the performing side of your life. Um, well, at the moment. Um Performing for me is different to what it's been throughout, I guess, a fair part of my life in that I, maybe it's because I'm in my late 30s now that I've decided that I like playing jazz and classical more than rock. But um, but because I, I could never make a decision with my music, I, um, I did a classical degree on double bass. Um, and but also did singing grades and all sorts of stuff but mainly performed in rock and contemporary I guess you'd call it um until uh I was about 26 and that's when I started playing classically in orchestras and and followed that path for a while but I still couldn't quite completely commit to it but I guess um having kids and and I guess just um kids make you decide what you know what's worth spending the time on and um and that that's more recently led me down the path of jazz and classical and um so that's where most of my performance is at the and, moment and yeah. that's on double bass uh both, both. um both. Uh, double bass and vocals yep and so uh, yep so you go i was gonna say um when i um had a chat with your husband a few weeks ago adam he referred to you as a rock goddess, so we can't do that anymore. You, you, you're a classic <laughs> jazz goddess now. <laughs> <laughs> I do still get to sing some rock, but mostly in singing lessons with students. So it's just been a while since I've um, had a platform to do that. But it um, doesn't mean I wouldn't like to do it again. But um, wow. yeah, yeah, just maturing, I guess. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, let's, let's look at the the other part of maturing where you started from the early, the early years. Um, when, when did you know you were creative, Heather? Was it just a, a progression or did you wake up one day and go, that's, that's it. I can do this. Um, I, I don't know that I could put any sort of date on that in that um, I, when I was born, my mum and dad had just quit their jobs. Um, my mum was a high school maths teacher um, my dad was an architect and they both gave it up to become private music teachers. My mum played the piano, well, she'd done eighth grade piano, I think, um, and was a singer. And dad played the clarinet and saxophone and organ. And well, dad got his first job um, after he quit architecture, selling organs. And he hated selling organs, but he liked the free lesson that he had to give people with the organ. And so, They'd both um, just gone into music teaching when I was born um, and they're still, do, I think they're going to retire at the end of the year, but that's what they've been doing for the last 37, nearly 38 years. And, um, and so being born into that, um, I was in singing lessons and music lessons from, from the day I was born, I guess, really. And so just absolutely surrounded by it and, uh, Mum talks about uh, teaching lessons where she would give a student a scale to sing back and then you'd hear a little voice from the next room 
singing it back in said, which was me. And she said half the time it was more in tune than the student that was singing it back as well. <laughs> but I guess just being surrounded by it, it was, um, yeah, it was, I was going to classical concerts that my mum was singing, um, well, apparently from when I was, I think, a month old or something like that. And, and, um, and so as soon as I was old enough to kind of be a part of it, I guess I was, you know, I became my dad's bass player and um, yeah, I don't know. I could, so I definitely couldn't put a start date on it. It was just, that's just been my life, I guess. <laughs> you just had an immersive experience. It was just all around you. No choice. Yes. Yeah. Normally when I, um, start these um sessions too i i, I ask our guests what they brought along to drink and i haven't done that with you um mm. so I, I might i might just go there for a moment because you, you're a, i was gonna say you're a classy lady <laughs> you've brought along a glass of red by the look of it i have, I have. um i i'm not classy enough to know actually what kind of red it is <laughs> 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 i didn't check the bottle <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it's night. <laughs> yeah, it's night time. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> it, it doesn't matter for me. I still go coffee day, night. No, yeah. no way. Oh, no, I, don't no. mind. I don't mind a read it. <laughs> <laughs> um, when did you know that you wanted to pursue it as a career, though? It's one thing to be musical or creative. It's another thing to say, yes, I want to do this as, as my living. And mm. was there a moment? Um, yeah, well, that's probably um, easier for me to define in that um, I, I had a, a pretty massive bump in the road for me. When I got to high school, um, I'd been playing violin for seven years um, and decided it wasn't cool <laughs> anymore. I, I'd done it. I didn't you? know you played violin. This is a yeah, new one. That was my first instrument. I apparently begged my parents to let me play the violin from when I was about three. I started when I was five. And, um, but I got to high school and I thought, this is embarrassing. Probably because I, I just, you know, I, I'm sure I was a good musician, but I wasn't that good at violin. I wasn't good enough for it to be cool. <laughs> and so <laughs> I wanted to, I quit. Um, and the school band needed a bass player. And my, my dad said, um, if I took up bass, then I'd never be out of work. And he was right. Um, and I started my own band with my brother called Silent Scream. And I loved it. It was the best. And I, I sang and played bass from almost from the start of that band. Um, but then at almost at the same time, I was diagnosed with what's called otosclerosis and I lost about 60% of my hearing when I was about 14 and got incredible, incredibly bad tinnitus and pulsing in my ears, which was really frustrating um, and noticeably lost my hearing. Like I found it really hard to understand conversations a lot of the time. Um, rock music I could still hear. Um, but I had a, when I was diagnosed, I, I went to an ENT who confirmed what they had, sus I guess, suspected um, that I had autosclerosis and he'd said that um, I have any sort of career in the public eye, which now I'm, well, yeah, I think it's a horrible thing to say to a 14 year old kid. Mm, um, mm. <laughs> but um I decided at that moment that um, apart from the fact that I hated that guy, that I was going to prove him wrong. Um, and so I just, I didn't go back for another hearing test until I was like 19 or something, but I just kept going and thought, nah, stuff this, I'll just keep playing and I'm going to, you know, get famous and stand up there and pretty much give him the bird. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Way to go. Um, so that, yeah, I guess there was a couple of, that was a big hiccup in that, even though I was really determined to do that, when I got to the end of high school, I wasn't sure about following music as a pathway. Um, I was also very studious and so I thought I should do something with my marks. Um, I went and started a communications degree at uni and I did a week of it and I 
I just couldn't stand it. So I, um, I moved over to a Bachelor of Music and I guess I, I'd kind of put these, I must have known that I wanted to do it because when I was 16, I took up double bass because in Newcastle, where I'm from, they only had a classical degree. I didn't play classical music at that time, but I thought I better take up double bass so I've got a classical bass instrument I can play if I want to go to uni. And that's what I did a week after I'd done the audition. So I knew I could, I knew I was in, um, but when I decided I, I just really couldn't stand communication studies, not that there's anything wrong with communication studies, it just wasn't for me. Um, I moved over to music and, and I had a brilliant time there, it was perfect for me and that's when I really knew. I, I loved being part of that community. It wasn't just the music, I mean I really loved learning more about music too, but it's like I found my people. Um, and yeah, it's, it's still like moving back to Newcastle recently. Um, I now I get to play in an orchestra with those, those that sort of same group of people. And it, it's like coming back to, yeah, well, old friends, but family and it, it's a lovely feeling. Yeah. That's wonderful. And so that's, that's another thing I didn't know about you. I didn't actually know that you had uh, loss of hearing. Mm-hmm. Uh, someone 60%. Is that still an issue like it doesn't um no um because uh when i was so with otosclerosis the hearing condition i have um it's affected by hormones and so when i was 13 or 14 obviously i hit puberty (laughs) and um and i that's when i lost my hearing but for a lot of women um it, it mainly primarily affects women they don't know about it till they fall pregnant um and that was and it's also often genetic and so my grandmother um that was her experience um and there's a an operation they can perform called a stapedectomy where they take your stapedius muscle stapes um sorry stapes bone um out of your ear which is the smallest bone in your body and replace it with a prosthetic um but at the time in newcastle the specialist that i'd seen when I was, uh, I probably went and saw a couple, when I was about 18 or 19. And everybody just told me about the side, like, you know, it was not side effects, but the, the risks that were involved. You know, you could, you could potentially lose all you'd be hearing in that year. So nobody really wanted to do it. Um, but the catalyst for me really finding out about it was when I had decided I was going to go over to the UK to live for 18 months. Um, two years I was planning but um, and uh, I'd realized that I couldn't understand what people were saying in Australia how on earth was I going to work behind a bar in the UK um, and it just it happened I guess these beautiful synergies happen but my mum at the time was doing a PhD in vocal science in Sydney um, and so she talked to a couple of the ENTs that worked in the same faculty and they recommended a doctor called Professor De Cruz, who was a specialist in autosclerosis. And I went to see him and it was the most amazing day in that I walked in and he's a violinist. He was the concert master of the doctor's orchestra. Oh, wow. And he basically, uh, at that stage, I'd finished my degree um, and I had an, a fellowship with Australian Youth Orchestra and, and he just said, I can't believe that you've been playing with this little hearing next Wednesday, you're going to come in and I'm going to fix your right ear. And, um, and that's what happened. And oh, wow. um, I, it, it was literally the, the last possible chance I could have had, cause I couldn't fly for six weeks or something like that. And it was about seven weeks before I went to the UK and I had to um, drive myself to Adelaide after that, to carry out my Australian youth orchestra fellowship. But it was amazing in that I got my hearing fixed and I went to Adelaide for this fellowship and it was the first time I'd really heard an orchestra because my hearing had been so muffled. It was an amazing experience. And, um, and my hearing, I mean, I got my other ear fixed by the same doctor when I was 28 and it's yeah, pretty amazing. I have very normal hearing these days. I mean, it could deteriorate a little quicker than other people's, but, I feel very lucky to have had the opportunity to 
to get my hearing back, but also I guess in some ways I appreciate my hearing. Like I think it's, I forget about it sometimes and take it for granted again, but to know what it's like to not be able to hear things like that uh, means I guess you appreciate the sound a lot more. That's extraordinary. And it is, and it is one of the questions I always ask: is what challenges have you had to overcome? Um, so that's a hell of a challenge. <laughs> yeah. I have to say. <laughs> so I didn't, yeah. yeah, it didn't really feel like a. I don't know how it didn't feel like a challenge. Like I, I know even with um, um, doing my HSC, I remember oh that being at school that I would specifically put myself in the front row of the class so that I could hear the teacher. Quite the um, opposite to me, Heather, I have to say. Uh, sorry? Quite the opposite to me. I preferred the back. <laughs> I was nerd through and through, don't worry. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, but and I'd have to do the same at uni. I, I had to sit right at the front. I often had to mm. check with people that I'd heard what the lecturer had said properly or I'd get lecture notes to make sure that I knew what I was doing. Um, and, but the other thing is that because otosclerosis um, is a bone conduction problem, so actually what happens is there's, um, you, you can't hear well through here, but you can still hear with bone, the bone yes. conduction past where the hearing problem is. And so uh, the Dr. De Cruz that fixed my hearing, he actually seemed to think that that would have drawn me to double bass in that, because the bass was resting against my bones, I could still hear it really clearly. Um, and so I guess in that way, it was more that I wouldn't be able to hear the violins I was playing with or something like that. So um, I just had to learn to really follow conductors and um, yeah, I don't know. But it, so it didn't feel like a challenge at the time, but yeah, if I um, heard of somebody else, but when I look back on it, I guess, I think, I don't know how I did that, but yeah. Hmm. So challenges are one thing. What about resistance? So you've decided to take on a, a career in music, uh, a notoriously lucrative and stable career. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Now your parents <laughs> obviously do it. Uh, did you encounter resistance to pursuing that or is it something that was fairly easy yeah um resistance yes sometimes um i guess i have felt a bit like music's a curse um i know it sounds horrible to say but um because for me um and being in a relationship where another person has music in in their life and and i guess being surrounded by a family that's like that it's almost like each person I believe that that music's really important to them I guess probably it's for all arts I'm guessing um, it's like you have another child that you have to look after you have to give time to it or otherwise um, things don't feel right for you, you become this horrible negative person um, and so sometimes I've felt like music was a curse. I wish I could just do a nine to five job and come home and in, enjoy some nothing time. Um, but because of the way, because of having music, I feel that I, I still have to earn money, obviously. So I have to, even though I teach music to earn money, um, it's still a job. So I still have to do, do that. But then I need time to nurture my own artistic stuff and so sometimes it feels like it's just too much like it's too much especially when you have children as well so you have real physical children to look after as well as your own artistic child and and need to make room for, for all the other artistic children that are in your family as well so yeah if that makes sense I don't know so no, yes sometimes it, it does I, and, and I yeah. love that you refer to it as artistic children why do you do that? Um, I well, actually, I read a book um, called "The Artist's Way." Um, Fabulous book. When I, and uh, and they refer to she refers to it. Julia Cameron is the author's name as nurturing your artistic child, taking it out on play dates, dates and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, and yeah. Um, and that really worked for me. 
a wonderful book. I read it oh, many years ago myself and um, did the whole journaling thing for a while and the stream of consciousness, yeah. the dates. The, yeah, fantastic. And so if anyone uh, is looking for a bit of inspiration, grab the book, Julia Cameron, The Artist's Way, fabulous yeah. book. Yeah, yeah, it, it um, actually made a big difference for me in that um, even with um, performance anxiety, um, the journaling aspect of it, I still use to this day if I feel that I'm really anxious about something, about a performance or particularly when I was doing a lot of orchestral auditions um, where often you know the panel of people you're about to play for and um, but it's it's high high level stuff that you've got to play that you're pretty much playing at your at your peak um or or you're trying to and not <laughs> not playing at your peak um and so to get rid of the anxiety so many times before an audition i would go and sit in a in a cafe and write until until i had nothing else to write so writing out all the the negative things that i was thinking or the things I was imagining could happen in, in the audition. And, and that's always worked for me, just getting rid of all that to, to settle down anxiety. That kind of leads into um, some of my, my other questions on process. Um, and this may actually be more applicable, or maybe it is, maybe it isn't, to the writing part of what you do. Um, mm -hmm. So we've talked about the performing, the playing, and I'm, I'm curious about the writing um, that you do and, and what that is and, and involves. Mm -hmm. so. um, yeah, these days I write mainly um, music for church and music more particularly for kids style or what they, what's termed multi-generational music <laughs> these days. Um, but I, I guess I kind of aim it more at my kids. Um, uh, the kids go to a thing called Messy Church, which is, um, I don't know, a new movement in church, I guess you'd call it. It's supposed to be for families. And and the particular church that we go to, um, I guess, is quite progressive in theology. And um, and so I wanted to write some, some music for it that reflected that, whereas a lot of the old hymns doesn't really, don't really fit for... So what we do these days and um uh so I just started doing that and it yeah it's probably been more successful than any of the other stuff I've written before which is pretty funny because I wrote it not intending to do anything with it apart from take it along so the kids could sing it um and yeah that's been a really nice outlet because I guess um just like uh music was around me from when I was born. I have attended the same church as my kids now go to as well since I was born. And um, it's the church we were married in. It's the church my parents were married in. It's the church my grandparents went to and it's the church my great grandparents went to. So oh, wow. it's, yeah, it's that sometimes I feel like there's so much of my own culture that comes from that that one building that's happened in that one building that it's nice to give a little bit back to that. So, um, so people can buy this music, can't they? If they, they, go, can. if they go to your website. <laughs> yes. Yes. I will, put in, I will put in the show notes, um, the, the web address, but it is heatherprice.com.au if I'm not mistaken. It is. Okay, we'll mention it now. Go along um, and, and, and buy all of her music. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, yeah. <laughs> Just do go it. Go for it. Yeah, go for it, exactly. <laughs> buy, it, buy it twice. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about process. So when you're writing, um, do you have a particular process that you follow? Is there, for example, a particular time of day you like to write, a place you go, a favourite chair? Um, you know, a favourite drink that you like to take along, that sort of thing? No. Um, I find most of my writing happens within a period of about a minute. <laughs> um, <laughs> like it's really quick and most of it happens lyrically. Um, it was lyric driven. Um, so, yeah, I might have an idea for something that, I want 
um, a song about and I'll get even just one line come to me and and it usually comes I guess attached with some sort of melody or at least a rhythm um, and so my iPhone is my best friend and I chuck voice memos on and I quickly get that down before I forget it but nine times out of ten it's in between teaching lessons or um, actually the most productive place for me to write is if I have a, a car journey I have to do and I'm actually in the car on my own um, I have written so many so many songs like that just um, you know, if I've got a student that's got an exam I've got to go to that's an hour away or something like that, yeah, nine times out of ten, I'll come back with at least one or two songs, like the choruses written. Mm. Wow. Who, who are having a phone next to me and, yeah. So this is I find this interesting. Um, I've been writing myself for a long time and it used to be good old pen and paper. These days I capture everything electronically um and, and that's one of the questions i ask how do you make sure you don't lose that inspiration so you use the voice memo uh and then do you what do you do with it after that do you go back and then transcribe it or start working on it and capture it some in some other way or hmm. um yeah i think once upon a time i would have sat down and written it all out and like really thought about the lyrics a lot and and now um i just don't get that time very often and and so I mean even not just with writing um, but even with practice most of my singing practice happens in the car to and from work like when I when I'm there without kids or anything like that I just that's when I do it and so same thing with writing um, you know I and and with learning music or writing music what I find is my brain will just churn the idea over and sing that part over until it, it sort of finds a pathway to what's coming next. Right. And that's when I need my iPhone there again, because I need to get that idea down. But, um, but yeah, to me, I find that um, it's repetition of like just sort of sticking with one, sticking with one song or sticking, sticking with what I've got for a song and then singing that through enough. And it, it, most of the time it, it's not a conscious idea to sing it through. It just keeps going over and over and over in my head. It's like my brain does it without, without me making it do it. If that makes sense. I don't, I don't know how to explain it better than that. No, it makes perfect sense. It's, it's very similar to my process, actually. A lot of repetition. Mm -hmm. I think if people were watching the writing process, well, they'd be bored silly. <laughs> if it was like, <laughs> there's a lot of repetition and then it's like oh then it goes somewhere and you go oh okay and you follow that path at least that's how mm. i do it um now i understand that the, the singing practice in the car that's what i used to do on the way to lessons <laughs> <laughs> hey at least you did it <laughs> <laughs> I was say, you could never tell could you um how do you deal with distractions now you're a busy woman you've got a couple of gorgeous daughters you've got um, a husband you've got demands on your time so how do you deal with those distractions when you want to create um sometimes i think you have to consciously make time um so i've had um yeah i've had periods of time where i've actually decided i would get up at six o'clock in the morning and you know go and have meditation time or, um, you know, whatever, whatever I feel like doing in order to kind of get that space, even if it's not actually sitting down and being creative yeah. um, mm. or creating something, it's just making space for something like that. But sometimes um, when things are really busy, like for me, I guess it's different because for me, often when things are really busy, it means there's performances on and I find that just gets me zinging. And so, um, even though it's busy, I'm feeling really creative. And sometimes that, that is enough to get something to blow it, like get, get ideas to come flowing as well. Um, but sometimes as well, I, I find, you know, I've got to pay attention to which way to go usually with it, but sometimes it, it's important to just know it's okay to wait as well. Um, and that well, for my work, it comes in ebbs and flows and that there will be a downtime and that it will be really nice to write 
um, but to enjoy what's happening when, when it's busy because if I try and fight it, I don't enjoy any of it and that's, that's no good for creativity. Mm. Um, so I've found riding the wave and, and, and learning to wait is good. Um, and, yeah, um, that, that's probably my, my favourite way to do it at the moment. Um, but just, and also knowing that sometimes 10 minutes is enough that I don't have to look for a period of four hours or something like that to to sit down and write, but just just enough time to get an idea started is usually good. Okay, so we lost Heather for a moment, but, she, but she's back. And that, folks, <laughs> the vagaries of the Australian internet I'm afraid. Anyway, you're back. And we were talking um, before you disappeared on me um, about inspiration. What inspires you to create? Mm. Yeah, um, I don't know. If, I don't know. Um, it's so many different things, I guess. Um, I, I, I actually find that often hmm, with writing I guess um, it's very much to do with seeing that there's a need for something I, I find it hard to to sit down and it, it's occasional that um, I just sit down and write a song because that's how I'm feeling that's definitely how I used to write when I was younger I just was angry about something and wanted to write, write about it. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and now I feel like my, and, and maybe it's a time thing um, that my writing is more a functional sort of thing. Um, um, but as for being inspired creatively, just to like as, as a whole to sort of just turn up to the instrument or turn up and, and, and do something creative. Um, I find collaboration is what really um, gets me going. Um, I do like to play for myself as well, but but collaborating with other people, um, I guess it kind of puts a deadline on it as well, but it's so rewarding too. I think there's something incredibly um, unspeakably special 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 gosh unspeakably special about um the act of playing music together um and something really spiritual about it in that you're sort of connecting without speaking and um you know in classical music you don't even count each other in you breathe each other in someone sort of sniffs and then all of a sudden you're all in together you know <laughs> and um and yeah, the the more I play it, the more I really love that. I just I like that that no one's talking, but somehow you're all on the same the same time frame. Everybody's yep. you know feeling the same tempo and moving in the same same way. And um, but you don't have to think too deeply about it at the same time even though it is such a deep experience it's just playing what's on the page or you know in jazz you're not just playing what's on the page but yeah I think that's what really spurs me on is the the high I get from playing with other people and um and you know that the writing side of it too I guess that that probably works as well when I was saying it's functional these days I write songs for them to be sung and so in the act of singing them with other people, that, that gives me a huge sense of satisfaction and spurs me on to want to write more. Um, yeah, so I think that, that's probably the best way of describing it. Brilliant. I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna take you back a little bit. You've got two young daughters and um, mm -hmm. you were their age once. Not very long ago. Uh, ah. <laughs> what advice would you give a younger you? What advice would you give your daughters about pursuing a creative life? Um, 
just to, it, it has to come from your own guts, your desire to do it. Um, so, you know, I, I have so many students come through and, and you can tell the ones that it's their desire and you can tell the ones that their parents desire. Um, so as much as, you know, there's things that I would love to say to my kids, I think they should do. Um, I think it, it's often important to stay out of the road and, um, and mistakes have to be made and sometimes opportunities have to be missed in order to somebody, for somebody to, to really see it for themselves. Um, so I think, yeah, unfortunately, even though, like, you know, I have my own regrets about things that I, I didn't do, um, that I had opportunities to do. Um, but if somebody had have made me do them, I couldn't say that I would have looked back at them and thought, oh, well, I'm really glad that somebody made me go and do that, that show. Lucky I did, because otherwise I'd be sitting there regretting it. Um, but, you know, the act of having missed that opportunity has meant that, you know, in the future, I'm, I, didn't, I didn't miss the next opportunity, if that makes sense. So I think so much of it is just so important for it to be your own desire. Um, that yeah, that, that's probably the only advice I reckon that could be given. Well, I think it's fantastic advice, actually. And um, you're spot on. <laughs> Us parents, we live vicariously through our children, don't we? <laughs> yeah, well, it's easy to have. I mean, I reckon it would be impossible to not have regrets about things in your life. And so then you think you're going to stop your kids from having regrets by telling them about it. But oh, wow. I think it just creates more pressure, you know. Part of the learning process. Mm. Are there any particular creatives that you really love and admire that you just think, wow, they're the bee's knees and I wish that was me? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> um, I guess there's some, you know, bigger scale um, creatives that I really admire. Um, I I love Stevie Wonder. I mean, I know there's probably a, a million people in the world who love Stevie Wonder, but but there's something about the way he sings that just like it it shines when he's. I don't know how to explain it, but I yep. feel so much that you can hear his personality in his singing, and that's always been. I mean, apart from the fact that he writes the most incredible chord progressions, um, but he just yeah he you can hear him in his music and that's amazing. That's, that's so inspiring. And he's, you know, 70 and he still sounds like he's 30 singing, which is pretty incredible, but you know, he's big scale. And I guess as well being some, having gone through the whole losing hearing thing, um, you know, so he's lost his sight and, and I know that, that should make you, you, your hearing even more acute. But I just mean, you know, conquering adversity and still just carrying on and doing it really damn well. Doing it real well. pretty awesome. Um, I guess another one, um, when I did lose my hearing, I, I actually looked into quite a few musicians that were hearing affected and, and um, our youngest daughter, Evie or Evelyn um, was named after a percussionist by the name of Evelyn Glennie. And uh, she's a lady who's completely, she's um, completely deaf. Uh, she lost her hearing, um, but she's one of the world's leading percussionists and she performs with many orchestras and, and so she plays barefoot so that she can feel the vibrations. That's how she hears sound. Oh, wow. uh, she's an incredible, well worth looking into. Um, but, you know, not, not just that. I think my own parents have been a huge inspiration for me in that um, um, my mum, you know, she, she started her opera career when she was 39. And, um, and, and it, in some ways it seemed like everything she touched turned to gold, but, but she worked really hard for that. And, um, and yeah, I think such an inspiration, especially you, me being uh, late thirties now to know that it's not over. Um, you don't have to be as a rock musician or like 
you often sort of think 30, you hit 30 and it's over. If you haven't made it by the time you're 30, what the hell are you going to do? You know, <laughs> and, um, and my parents have both continued to, to play music and earn money through music. And, um, and even though I've seen the hard side of that for them as well, um, I guess, yeah, they've sort of both paved the way for me to know that that's possible. And that's, um, yeah, I, I definitely I look up to them, but I'm also very inspired by them because they're still they're still doing it. <laughs> still doing it. Good on, it's I'm awesome. Still playing gigs with my dad. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And 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 on that note, I and I must uh, I'm going to publicly thank you because when I came back to music in my mid forties, after a almost well probably a good twelve year hiatus, um, <laughs> you you encouraged me enormously. And I'm in my mid fifties and I'm still doing it. And you're a big reason, part of that reason. So. No, oh, thanks. You are, you are well, a... I, I'm lucky enough to have, um, you know, I have students who are seven or eight, but I also have um, students who are 86 and 88. And my 88 year old student, he still rec records albums, at least right. one or two a year. <laughs> and, one or two um, a year. Well, he's a legend. <laughs> and uh, I just, I, you know, I see the quality of life that, that music, or the quality that music brings to his life. Um, and, and I think it's amazing that just, um, that obviously it, it's more than just an act of singing. It is life-giving in a lot of ways. Um, underneath all the, the money-making and all that, we, we need other things to sustain us and, yeah, so I think age is no barrier. I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> um, I'm going to let you go because you have uh, things to do and a family to look after. And I really, really appreciate your time. It's great to catch up. It's, um, it's been a little while. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to give some thought, if you can, to uh, anyone who you would like me to interview who might be interested in being interviewed for that matter. And can pass their details mm. on to me because it's how I get to know <laughs> who to talk to next. So if you if yeah. you could do that and um, and pass any of those details on to me, that'd be really appreciated. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you to stay on the line. We'll have a chat after the after the recording's finished. But thank you. It's been wonderful. Um, I encourage everyone again get along to heatherprice.com.au. Buy everything she's recorded because she's. <laughs> Got to keep her in beer and Skittles. <laughs> um, all right. Thank you. Um, I'm going to end the recording now. And, um, yeah, we'll, we'll catch up soon, I hope. Yes. All right. Thanks. Take care. For more information, visit Creative Conversations at www.creativeconversations.com.au.